Good evening from Geneva. Uh, welcome to our Sustainable Development Impact Summit. This session is about innovating for meeting the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And we will also focus especially on the Stockholm Plus 50 conference that's coming up next summer. It is 50 years since world leaders came together next summer in Stockholm and really kind of invented the sustainability term. Uh, sustainability is about uh, inclusive economics, it's about uh, social responsibilities, but it's also about uh, the environment. And all this comes together with the ambition 17 sustainable development goals uh, that we have uh, to reach uh, to make our planet a livable, livable place by 2030. And we have a great panel uh, to discuss uh, this uh, tonight. We have the Deputy Prime Minister uh, from Sweden, uh, Per Bullen. Uh, Sweden is also uh, the host of uh, Stockholm Plus 50 in June next summer. And Per is also the Environment and Climate Minister of Sweden. So he will be going to COP26 and hopefully be successful in delivering such an ambitious uh, COP26 that it lays and paves the ground for really uh, also an ambition, ambitious uh, text uh, in Stockholm. We have Inger Andersen with us. Uh, she is the executive director of uh, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, that was born in 1972, came out of the Stockholm uh, conference will also play a major role, of course, at the COP, but also in Stockholm next uh, summer. Then we have Geraldine Machette. Uh, she's the CEO and uh, also the CFO uh, of DSM, a uh, very important Dutch company that uh, has left a big footprint uh, in the sustainability field uh, the last years. And then we have Ariana De Yuan. She is the um, founder uh, of Forested Food, one of the eco-entrepreneurs uh, that will make this happen, a local action uh, on the ground. And last but not least, um, Vice President uh, Al Gore. We know uh, Al also as a Nobel laureate, but also first and foremost uh, as a great uh, thought leader uh, in the field of uh, climate change, has made a huge impact there. So, Welcome to this uh, great panel. I would like to go to you first, uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister uh, Per Bullen. It's a lot of responsibility that Sweden is taking on again uh, next summer. Uh, there has to be a lot of innovations, entrepreneurship, and thinking um, out of the box uh, to make sure that we meet uh, also the sustainable development goals. So please uh, share with us uh, your ambitions and how we're going to make it happen so uh, we can uh, change the non-sustainable uh, path we are on today. Let's face it, our planet is burning. Well, thank you very, very much, Berger, and uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, dear planetary guardians and uh, also supporters of transformative change for a healthy and prosperous planet for all. It's a great honor for me, of course, to be on such a distinguished panel and also being able to take part of these important discussions. Uh, I think these are important times and we have a lot to do and a short time to do it. So these kinds of gatherings are, are extremely important. And. Uh, of course, I think you agree with me that how to deliver sustainable development inclusively and universally by 2030 has really become the defining issue, uh, not only of our time, but uh, also for our and all future generations. So. Uh, as you say, we face many challenges uh, and uh, not least the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic that has set so many countries back, uh, has erased hard-won victories and also unfortunately de delayed the implementation of the 2030 agenda. But however, we must also see that the road to recovery also offers a unique opportunity to uh, redefine our relationship with nature, making sure that our economies and societies are within the planetary boundaries, but also an opportunity to accelerate the transformation towards a more sustainable and uh, a more inclusive society. 
the policies that we boldly decide on today and the uh, concrete actions that we take today will be decisive for how well we succeed in building a nature positive but also a net zero and a resilient world that is adapted to the future. And this is also the reason why we have decided to host Stockholm Plus 50 next June, 50 years after the first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment uh, in Stockholm. And uh, we really believe that Stockholm Plus 50 provides a unique opportunity to uh, engage with all stakeholders, including, of course, the business community, but also civil society, and not least the young people, the youth of the world has raised their voices, craving of us that are adults to really make action happen and take our responsibility. And uh, we have a responsibility to listen to their voices. So uh, we have to uh, also discuss together how we can accelerate the transformative action to fully deliver on the 2030 agenda, but also keeping the 1.5 degree goal alive and uh, foster a truly sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our uh, aim is to gather the world in Stockholm once again to mobilize energy for a collaborative and inclusive effort uh, of joint action uh, that is oriented uh, towards solutions uh, on our urgent global goals. We need to move fast and we need to move forward. So with a strong focus on uh, implementation and also on integration, thing, uh, the pressing agendas, but not least uh, making generations come together, Stockholm Plus 50 can be a very much needed stepping stone to uh, get urgent action going and to uh, get us moving towards a healthy and prosperous planet for all. And uh, one important aspect of the required transformation is a transition to more sustainable and just global supply chains. And uh, I believe that Stockholm Plus 50 could serve as an important platform for mobilizing and also showcasing innovative solutions to sustainability challenges that we do face across the global supply chains. Uh, not least how innovations can help us advance both uh, climate action but also biodiversity conservation, which we know also is a very pressing issue. However, we of course need to do this together uh, without multi-stakeholder engagement that uh, involves governments, but also companies, entrepreneurs and young people, and also not least civil society. We will never be able to address the challenges that we face successfully. The world today has the largest youth population in history, and 90% of our young people live in developing countries. And we cannot talk about the well-being of people and planet without involving young people in such discussions and in also finding adequate solutions to the challenges that we face together. It's too late to use old solutions in a new world that is rapidly evolving, and we will never deliver on transformative action if we can't also use new innovative methods. And therefore, I also like to commend the uh, World Economic Forum on the opportunities provided in your Uplink platform, where young entrepreneurs are and, and innovators can be linked up with both decision makers, but also with investors, and where their ideas on how to tackle SDG challenges can be scaled up and scaled up rapidly. So we now need more bold steps to that truly accelerate the delivery of the 2030 agenda and the threat of climate change and also ecosystem degradation and natural disasters. We know they're increasing and we know we have to face these challenges. So it's time to listen to the science and to uh, embrace the opportunity of transforming our societies. And I believe that Stockholm Plus 50 offers an opportunity to make the next bold steps in this regard and getting the world moving. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much, uh, Pe, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and also thank you so much for underlining the importance of action here. I think we all know, know uh, why, but we have to focus on how, how to make sure that we then mobilize uh, the youth, but also the private sector, as you mentioned, will come back to that, and you can count on the full support of the World Economic Forum in the run-up uh, to Stockholm. We see that companies are now in uh, many sectors leading, and uh, we hope to mobilize even more of uh, them. I would like now to go to Inger Andersen um, in UNEP. Uh, I think you will also work very, very closely uh, with the Swedish um, hosts 
on this uh, important conference. And uh, it is uh, not uh, only about uh, negotiating new texts, it's really about making sure uh, that we meet the sustainable development goals and we are successful in implementing the necessary policies, both on climate, but also on nature-based solutions. So over to you, uh, Inger in Nairobi. Thank you very much. And greetings from a rainy season in Nairobi, which has begun, which delayed, but we're very happy that it's here. So look, um, 1972, I want to transport you back just for 30 seconds to think about what was it that made the world come together in 72. It was a time when they were there was a, an awakening around environmental issues, largely on the pollution and the toxicity side. It was a time when we had bubbling, the Rhine was bubbling, the Thames was bubbling. It was a time when fish were floating because they were dying. Uh, and it was obviously a time when we had uh, an acid rain in Norway and in Scotland and elsewhere. So there was this de decision to host this conference to speak to the human environment. It was a watershed moment. A number of treaties came out of it, uh, including CITES, CMS, and others. We can go into that in another session. But 50 years have gone, and we now understand that, and, and of course, UNEP was created, which is a good thing, because this is the United Nations response and sort of the global conscience on the environment. But what we are now understanding is exactly as we heard from the uh, from the deputy prime minister that we are pushing against the very planetary uh, limits uh, of what the earth can sustain we in unep speak about these three crises the climate crisis the biodiversity and nature crisis and the pollution and waste crisis so what is it we're going to do to fix this so that we can land on the sustainable development goals well we have to understand what's underlying these crises is us, our unsustainable consumption and production. And this means that if we're gonna shift, and that's in a sense SGD 12, right? Sustainable consumption and production. And that takes us right to circularity. We are taking stuff out of the earth, mining, um, oil, obviously, um, textiles that we create, um, or, or all the raw materials, the resources that we take out of the earth. We make something with it and then we discard it right back into the atmosphere, into the environment, into the oceans, into the soils. This does not compute anymore. And so seeing uh, companies leaning in on circularity, and we're beginning to see that, which is very, very exciting. We are seeing it in, in a beginning around plastics, we have a long way to go, mind you. We're seeing it in textile to some extent. We're seeing it elsewhere. So a lever has to be um, that of circularity. Second lever, which I won't have to go into too much because I'm sure others will pick it up, has to be around the digitalization, a digital transformation, using technology to be smart about our resources and to be smart about um, how we use and dispose and how much we can keep in circulation. And then obviously we cannot be just two days after we've come out with the NDCs and seen that we are so far from hitting where we need to go. And yet we understand that the conditional NDCs, i.e. the unfunded part of the NDCs, if that were funded, we would have a different conversation. So finance matters. And here, yes, public finance and 100 billion per year will be important. We promised that back in COP15 of climate in Copenhagen. We now have to deliver it, but also to move the financial the banking sector and the investors and the insurance sector, because that, after all, is what will help shift. We at UNEP are working with UNEP FI, the financial initiative, where significant uh, commitments, three trillion, uh, have already been committed uh, uh, on the financial initiative. Sorry, 60 trillion in assets have already been committed in the financial, uh, and that's about 40% of the total banking portfolio. That's what we need circularity, get with the technology, and be smart about finance. Thank you. No, well, thank you so much, uh, Inger. Let's uh, go over to you, uh, Geraldine. Uh, we know uh, that uh, you have great passion, uh, both for the environment, but also 
uh, you have strongly underlined uh, also the responsibility for business there. You already heard uh, Deputy Prime Minister Per Bolon mention uh, the supply chains. We have to fix the supply chains uh, to make sure that they're more sustainable and also that uh, they are working in the interest of the climate and also for uh, biodiversity, oceans, and we should get less uh, plastic waste out of this. Maybe you can share some of the experiences and your aspirations at DSM. Absolutely. And thank you, Borga, for having us on this panel on such an exciting week, actually, because it's the UN Food Systems Summit this week. And there is a lot of talk about food. And if there's one flip side of climate, biodiversity, etc., the linking pin is actually the food systems. Um, also, it actually triggers me. I didn't realize about Stockholm. I was born in 1972, so it puts a little extra personal touch to what's coming up. Um, now, in, in terms of what do we need to do to really reach our aims. We've got nine years left. Um, as DSM being the world leader in what makes food and feed nutritious, we are at the middle of the supply chain when it comes to how we produce food and how food is consumed. So this is where we play the most. And let me use that as, as a bit of a thread um, to, to connect a few dots when it comes to scaling innovation. And let's take food waste as an example, um, which is, by the way, a major challenge given that we waste at least, and the latest estimates are much higher than that, than one third of the food that we produce, wow. and that the environmental footprint of that food is actually enormous, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of water, in terms of biodiversity, etc. Now, you know, in terms of scaling innovation, um, the way we like to think of it as a private you know, company um, or a private player, we're not, we're a listed company, is in four pieces. Um, firstly, it's about scaling innovation, which is out there, and particularly new technology, um, new, whether it be technology on, on digital, but all sorts. And here, I would love to flag the uplink um, and the 1,300 entrepreneurs, of which we have one with us this evening, um, where there's a lot of very creative, good science that needs scaling. And as a larger company, corporation, we can do that. So let's make sure that we connect the, the small scale startup entrepreneurship to the larger players to accelerate innovation. So that's aspect number one. Aspect number two is, of course, um, the private sector needs to invest in smart innovations. And here I could come with all examples if we have time later on the panel of how biotechnology, how science can radically change the Im environmental impact of producing food, which, by the way, is the most common human activity on the planet, but leads to, for example, two thirds of deforestation. So how do we start applying our science? And here we can reduce the methane uh, burped by cows for example, by 30 to 80 percent. It is durable. It is in our hands today. How do we scale that? So how do we keep investing? Second. The third is, of course, partnership. Uh, I think we've heard it both from the Deputy Prime Minister and from Mayor of, you don't do this alone. So how do we connect with our partners, whether it be governments um, or private sector or NGOs? And I'm so excited to see the UN Food Systems Summit come up with these country pathways where there's a dialogue which is bringing all of this together which I think will help these partnerships really accelerate so that we can get somewhere by 2030. And last but not least is how do you actually connect across the value chain? Because consumers are increasingly interested in the environmental footprint of what they consume, whether it be clothing or food in our case, but often it's very difficult for a consumer to know the environmental footprint of what it is that they are buying. So typically connecting from end to end a supply chain is critical. And here I would like to call out the World Economic Forum, um, what you've done in terms of creating the food innovation hubs. Uh, there are seven in the world. They are regionally relevant, which is critical because food is global and hyper-local. So how do we connect the innovations that can scale in those regions uh, and bring that innovation power across the value chain much, much faster. So for me, it's about scaling, investing, partnering, and connecting the value chain. Thank you so much, uh, Geraldine. And also for uh, mentioning uh, Uplink, I think this is a very nice uh, segue into uh, your contribution, uh, Ariana, you're on Uplink. Uplink is a platform that we created 
uh, at the World Economic Forum where we try to put uh, main challenges related to the Sustainable Development Goals on there being water, uh, food, uh, climate, and then we invite eco-entrepreneurs to come up with their solutions and meet other potential partners. So it is really about scaling up innovation, as mentioned by you, Geraldine, but also Deputy uh, Prime Minister uh, mentioned it. So, um, Ariana, it's not always easy uh, to be an entrepreneur and uh, make uh, innovations uh, happen out in the field. So I know you've been uh, successful, but you also met challenges. So uh, over to you. Sure. Um, and yeah, we are a very proud and thankful member of the Uplink community. Um, just to give a little context, Forested Foods is an agroforestry startup, and we exist to combat deforestation and biodiversity loss by unlocking more value from conservation-based agroforestry across the global south. So complementary to DSM, um, who Geraldine explained as the middle of food systems, we're, um, we're basically that player at the beginning. We build, develop, and work with networks of smallholder forest communities to regeneratively produce, aggregate, process, and distribute things like forest honey, spices, gums, resins, fruits, really anything that can grow in a forest. Um, what Forested Foods is working towards is building the Cargill for deforestation-free and regenerative agriculture, agriculture products. Um, we're not only building forest-friendly supply chains, but carbon-negative ones as well, so that we can be the sourcing partner and solution to businesses working towards carbon neutrality. Um, we've been building Forested Foods for about two years now, starting in Ethiopia, where we've started by mobilizing a network of a thousand smallholder farmer beekeepers to build a vertically integrated brand of single origin honeys and soon um, expanding into bulk honey and bee products from Ethiopia's indigenous trees. Um, our business model is really inspired by um, a lot of work that we were seeing across sectors. I was um, working for a few years in Ethiopia, where I arrived seven years ago now, um, initially to work for the NGO TechnoServe and building, strengthening smallholder farmer inclusive supply chains with um, private sector partners like Nespresso and Diageo, um, but also foundations like Gates, as well as the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. Um, and it was during this period where I realized not just the challenges, but more importantly, um, the opportunity for a more vertically integrated field-based agroforestry enterprise to be a solution for an, a growing number of these larger corporations, um, notably corporations interested in investing in sourcing ingredients and supplies that did better by people and for the planet. And while I saw that these corporations, especially food and other CPG companies, had the you know, power to market products and scale, I saw an interesting opportunity to embed forested foods in emerging markets um, like Ethiopia and around the global south to serve as um, the increasingly necessary, reliable, trustworthy partner, um, a partner with our boots truly on the ground, with supply chain expertise in aggregating the production potential of rural, fragmented smallholder forest farmers, um, and really ensuring quality control from the forest through agro-processing operations and finally distribution. And while corporations are increasingly investing in projects to improve sourcing activities, which you know, we love to see more of. Um, there is an inevitable bureaucracy, at least compared to startups, that allows ventures like us to be much more nimble in navigating the complex dynamics of business and emerging markets, managing um, millions of contract farming schemes with smallholders, collecting data and deploying technologies across this rural fragmented network of smallholder producers. Um, Forested Foods is very much a nature-based solution to climate change. Um, it's honestly not rocket science, but we are leveraging the often overlooked power of behavior science and systems change approaches um, to work towards our vision of intact biodiverse forests across the global south. Um, understanding that many people view the environment as a component of our human world versus the reality that we humans are actually a small component living within our natural world, we believe that the best way to conserve the world's critically biodiverse forests um, is really by helping everyone generate more value, especially commercial value from conservation and from our forests. Thank you uh, so much and thank you for your leadership in this uh, field. Um, Al uh, Gore, uh, you listen uh, to the other panelists. We know uh, this is really uh, a year that matters a lot uh, for the future of our planet. We know COP26 is 
coming up. We also know important uh, meeting on biodiversity in China uh, in the spring. We have the Stockholm meeting, but I think uh, you will always focus on action uh, in this uh, field. So looking forward to hear your uh, take uh, on what is said, but also uh, how you look at the prospects uh, for the coming year. Are we going to make uh, the changes that are necessary? Well, thank you, Borga, and thank you for your personal leadership uh, on all of these issues we've been discussing. Uh, as of today, there are 40 days left before the beginning of COP26. Uh, and there's good news and bad news, and I'll come to that uh, in just a moment. But you've asked me, uh, Borga, to react to the other four speakers. I did not know what they were going to say, so I've been uh, furiously taking notes, uh, listening, and I will be very brief. First of all, Per uh, Boland uh, uh, in Sweden, um, yes, where the world will highly anticipate uh, the Stockholm uh, Plus 50 conference uh, next summer, and I want to honor uh, your prime minister at that time, Gru Brundtland, for her great leadership. And Per mentioned uh, the connection to the pandemic, Borga. Uh, I think there are five uh, parallels. Num number one, with both the pandemic uh, and the climate crisis, also biodiversity, the leading scientists have been accelerating uh, their efforts to warn the world uh, in the direst to possible terms. And the new IPCC report uh, just recently out is the starkest warning uh, yet. And when the leading scientists warned us about the pandemic, we didn't listen sufficiently. We should listen uh, on climate. Number two, both of these crises show us our interconnected world can be turned upside down uh, suddenly. Uh, number three, science and technology have given us the solutions to both of these crises, but we have not yet organized our global cooperation to the level where we can implement these solutions quickly enough. That's why these upcoming uh, meetings uh, um, uh, in Scotland and in China and elsewhere are so uh, crucial. In both cases, the worst consequences of the coronavirus and the climate crisis are delayed. There are no immediate uh, symptoms, and so this challenges our basic uh, human nature, asymptomatic uh, transmission uh, in the case of the pandemic. And although we have already seen uh, staggering climate-related weather extreme uh, disasters uh, all over the world, especially in the last three months, they're getting worse. The scientists tell us these events are nothing compared to what we would confront if we did not quickly uh, reach net zero and reduce these uh, uh, emissions. And finally, in both cases, there are negative tipping points that we must uh, avoid. The, the rapid mutation of the coronavirus could uh, still uh, give uh, a much more deadly uh, variants unless we have uh, equitable vaccine access all around the world. Uh, Inga uh, with UNEP in Nairobi uh, talked among other things about circularity and I compliment all of the UN um, uh, staff. Um, and it reminds me that two years before the Stockholm Conference in 1970, Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, put out his uh, epic uh, statement on the need for multi-stakeholder uh, capitalism. Geraldine with the DSM, and please let me honor uh, your former CEO, Feike Sabisma, who is our highly valued colleague uh, at the World Economic Forum. And you talked about uh, business uh, leadership, Geraldine, and indeed it is there on the part of so many businesses. And may I add, uh, the investor community is getting involved. There is now a net zero asset managers alliance that has pledged their portfolios will be net zero by 2050, quite a few of them by 2040. And the amount of uh, assets in these portfolios is now $43 trillion, which is about half of all of the assets under management worldwide. So the many in the business community are leading. Many are moving faster than uh, the politicians. Uh, and, and Geraldine also talked about the connection to food. 
the IPCC has warned us about the risk of multi-breadbasket failures. We are seeing the impact on food production, lower yields from the higher temperatures, from the drought. 1.1 million people are nearing starvation in Madagascar today in the southern cone of Africa and in too many other places. The impact of climate on food uh, is already quite apparent. But here, too, we have solutions because we can sequester more carbon in the soils while we increase yields and increase agricultural productivity. Uh, and finally, Ariana uh, de Yun uh, talked about forestry and agroforestry. And indeed, this is part of the new food production me methods that can help us make our globe sustainable and feed those uh, who are desperately in need of more nutrition uh, today. And I want to compliment the World Economic Forum for its initiative to plant one trillion trees. But we have to arrest the, the progression of the climate crisis to stop destroying the current forests. We have seen uh, fires uh, all over the world this year. In, in my country, you perhaps have seen it on the news. In Siberia, where there are even more, the news doesn't cover that so much. Uh, but here I will conclude with good news, Borga. The IPCC report also tells us that once we reach net zero emissions and are not adding to all of this heat trapping uh, pollution in the Earth's atmosphere, we can stop the increasing temperatures in as little as three to five years. And then uh, if we maintain net zero, up to 50% of the CO2 will fall out of the atmosphere in as little as 25 to 30 years. Some of the other gases will last longer. We have the opportunity. We can do it. In the next 40 days, we have to see much more action than we have thus far seen in the form of better pledges and follow through uh, activities on the part of those who will convene in Glasgow on October 31. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Al Gore, uh, for that. And as you so strongly underline, the cost of inaction so far exceeds the cost of action when it comes to climate. But uh, so much is at stake for our planet uh, in those 40 days. But when we look at the geopolitical picture now, uh, the G G2 relation between China and the US, uh, but also uh, the relationship now between the US, Australia, UK, and China, uh, it doesn't look that uh, good. But that's the geopolitics. Uh, how to uh, make sure that something that is in our common interest, all these countries are equally affected by climate change. So are you uh, concerned about the path you're seeing uh, towards uh, the COP no? Or do you think uh, there will be a breakthroughs like we saw uh, in Paris and as we saw in Kyoto uh, in 97? Well, yes, I am concerned, Borga, uh, very concerned, but we still do have 40 days. Uh, it, it, you mentioned the G2, and in the lead up to Paris, as you know, the cooperation between the two largest uh, emitters, uh, China and the U.S., uh, was one of the keys to securing that wonderful uh, uh, agreement. But in the run-up to Glasgow, uh, China has not uh, cooperated with the world community in the same way it did uh, six years ago. And in my country, the Congress has not yet found a successful pathway uh, to enacting the very bold uh, climate agenda that President Joe Biden has put forward. There is still time, and they may yet act. But both of these two largest uh, uh, polluters have to come to grips with their responsibility. Uh, I could say much more uh, about uh, China. They're building more new coal plants than the entire rest of the world put together. They're also building more uh, solar panels and windmills than the rest of the world put together. So there's good news and bad news. Uh, but, but finally, we are in the early stages, Borga, of a, an historic sustainability revolution uh, that is making the organization of the global economy based around reaching net zero uh, the centerpiece, the organizing principle for our economic 
uh, activities. It is at the scale of the industrial revolution and at the speed of the digital revolution. 90% of all the new electricity generation last year was wind and solar. The IEA says it will be 95% going forward. But we're still putting 162 million tons of heat trapping man-made global warming pollution into that thin shell of atmosphere. You see it behind me here. It's so thin and it's trapping so much heat. It is disrupting the water cycle. It is creating all of these disasters and a projected potential 1 billion climate immigrants uh, crossing borders that's already uh, begun. And this has a destabilizing impact on some political systems. So let's make the best use of these next 40 days. Thank you. I want to go to back. Uh, I want to go back to you, uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Per uh, Bullen. Uh, uh, you heard other speakers, uh, of course, great expectations uh, for S Stockholm and also Swedish leadership. But you heard um, former Vice President Al Gore here now, uh, also uh, greatly concerned about the run-up uh, to COP26. And I know that the EU will do a lot of climate diplomacy. I know that you yourself are also personally very engaged in this uh, question and will be going uh, to COP26. H how do you feel? Are, are you very concerned about um, the days that are uh, coming or do you feel that it is possible to break the impasse? Well, thank you for that very important question. And uh, I strongly believe that we have an opportunity to get the momentum going that we so urgently need. Uh, but of course, if we cannot even fulfill the uh, pledges that we have already made in previous uh, COPs, uh, it will be very hard to see the movement that is necessary on uh, COP26. And uh, for example, uh, the pledges on climate finance uh, remains to be fulfilled. And uh, from Sweden and also from the European Union, uh, we uh, will move forward in also providing the climate finance that is needed to get a momentum going. Uh, because what we need now is to take away all the excuses for inaction that uh, still exists, uh, unfortunately. And uh, we know that there are, uh, unfortunately, uh, global actors that are reluctant to, to move uh, in the direction and in the pace that we know is necessary. And uh, if we can uh, get the momentum through um, increased climate finance, I believe that that will at least uh, take away one of the obstacles. But in my view, uh, what is urgently needed is, is a, a new and different uh, look at what is a risk and what is an opportunity. Uh, we know that our world is transforming at a very, very fast pace, both with the climate crisis that is already upon us, that we see in extreme weathers all around the world, but also in uh, new technologies, digitalization and automatization that is really transforming our world. And uh, we know that uh, it is very prone to human nature that when we are in a changing uh, atmosphere and, and uh, changing uh, environment, it is very easy to stand still and uh, try to analyze what is happening. But we have to be aware that the very most dangerous thing we can do at the moment is to stand still. Uh, what we need now is to act, and we need to act fast. And uh, that is why I'm so inspired by the, uh, the innovators and the young entrepreneurs that are now using the new technologies to also provide solutions for us that we can scale up and use on a global level to really make the transformation happening. And uh, we know for a fact, and we've seen it so many times in Sweden, uh, not least, that when we do take the bold steps, when we invest for uh, transformation of industry and transformation of transportation, it is nothing that hampers our economy or our competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Rather, the opposite is really what provides us with a stable economy and, uh, and stable incomes for the future. So it should be a no-brainer. Uh, we should all see that uh, the only way forward is to now transform our societies and our economies. Uh, and what we need now is to take, uh, the, take away the, the excuses for inaction. And I believe that um, increased climate finance is a very important step that we should take and that we are willing to take. Thank you. And, and just, um, you know, imagine what a difference it would be make if we could make um, then green hydrogen uh, also cost effective. Uh, if we 10 years ago had had this panel and I said that uh, the price of solar would 
be falling to one tenth, or price of uh, wind would fall to one seventh. Uh, you guys probably would think I was a bit crazy, uh, but that's not the fact. So if you're investing in the new technologies, you're saying, then we can also make things uh, happen. We have little time left, so I, the, the rest of the speakers will have to stick to around uh, one minute. But uh, Inger Andersen, the new technologies make you optimistic? Well, like Al, I'll say that, look, uh, we launched the IPCC report a few weeks back. And at that launch, I said for 30 years, IPCC has come out with ever greater precision about what, what, hap what is happening and what we need to do. And yet we listened, but we didn't hear and we didn't take action. Now it really is a minute to midnight. Secretary General has come out and said, this is code red for humanity. We're meeting in New York right now and we're all virtual. So I am in New York the whole night, but at any rate uh, on this, we are convening the food system summit. We're convening the energy summit, all of this. But Glasgow has to succeed. And it is not enough to kick the can down the road. It is not enough to make promises. We said in Paris that we would come back with more ambitious NDCs. Now is the time to deliver them. And to deliver them with clear time marked, what am I going to do in 21, in 22, and 23? Ditto for biodiversity, don't have time to go into it, but it is time and 2022 will be a very decisive year. If we have not hit where we need to be in Glasgow, we are in dire straits, but as we've heard, we can do this. And that's the good news. The technology is there. Uh, we at UNEP are very proud and thank you, Al, Mr. Vice President, for mentioning the, the Net Zero Bankers Alliance we, and the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. Very proud to host these. Uh, industry is leaning in, sec private sector and finance is leaning in. So let's get this done. Thank you. Thank you, Inger. Uh, Geraldine? Yep, um, I would say indeed, um, coming back to the investors, there was a, a time when there was a bit this conflict of, yes, we can, but we can't. And, and there is now alignment. Uh, there is alignment from the investor side, the private sector and public sector to get this done. I think the one thing that really struck me with the pandemic is the speed at which things can move when you really need to. And and one of, of the ongoing, I think, um, holdbacks when it comes to climate is there's this mindset, it's going to take a long, long time. It doesn't have to. The technologies are there, the ability is there, and now the funding is starting to align. So I think the best thing we can do in the run-up to Glasgow is to be as many voices as loud as we can saying, please commit because it's doable. And, and that's what we can do to help, you know, give that little bit of backbone to, to go for it because it is possible, but we need to do it now. No, well, thank you, Ariana. I would say that I'm, I'm really looking forward to partnering with larger corporations, other NGOs and governments to really scale up conservation and use nature-based solutions to combat climate change. Um, it's, you know, climate change is very complex, but we can figure it out. Um, and I think startups bring a lot of the gusto and the unreasonable optimism and grit to figure it out. And what we really need is partnerships um, to develop and deploy technologies and non-technology solutions. Um, climate change was, you know, the crisis has been driven by intersectional challenges and we're going to have to solve it with intersectional solutions. Thank you. So then you have uh, one minute, Al, uh, at the end. Well, thank you, Borga. Uh, th just a few hours ago, uh, speaking to the UN General Assembly in New York, uh, President Biden announced a doubling of the U.S. Uh, commitment on climate finance. Uh, the U.S. is now arguably doing its share. Uh, some should will say it should be more. Of, of course, all nations should be doing more. But this should not be an obstacle. We have to make a success uh, of the Glasgow conference. Uh, I'm optimistic that uh, President Biden will also succeed in our Congress. Uh, and China has pledged net zero by 2060. It's not soon enough. But the world is moving. It's just not moving fast enough. We could stop using our atmosphere as an open sewer. That is the heart of the crisis. We have to stop the greenhouse gas 
emissions from increasing and we have to reduce them. The rest of it, it, it are all, it's all footnotes. We have to stop using the sky as an open sewer. Thank you for what the WEF is doing, Borga, and thank you for what you are doing. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you uh, to an amazing uh, panel. Uh, I'm so proud uh, to have you here with us uh, this evening uh, in Geneva. We'll at least uh, put all our efforts into mobilizing in a multi-stakeholder way uh, for COP26. We'll all then also meet at our annual meeting in Davos in January, where we will also make sure that businesses don't only support the outcome of COP26, uh, but also focus on nature-based solutions, also on all the other uh, sustainability challenges we're faced with, the SDGs, and also use this as uh, a platform for innovation, entrepreneurship, and thinking out of the box in the run-up to Stockholm um, 50. So thank you again for joining us, and uh, have a good evening.